Hi guys, welcome back to your online antenatal education videos. Uh, today we're on episode 10, um, which is going to be all about postnatal care. So postnatal care um, starts the moment you've given birth to your baby um, and normally ends with the midwife at around two weeks um, of baby's life. So we've got lots to talk about today. Um, so I'm going to start off by talking about um, what um, screening and routine tests um, and things we do for you and baby on your baby's birthday. Um, so obviously we've talked about the importance of doing the golden hour with your baby so all of that skin to skin and initiating breastfeeding or bottle feeding. Now once that's all done um, and baby's a little bit more settled that's the point in which we'll do things such as weighing your baby. Now we know that lots of you are always really keen to know how much baby weighs um, and normally once babies come out lots of people say oh how much does the baby weigh so this is the time um, which in which we're going to weigh baby so when we weigh baby we also do another of other, uh, a few other things at the same time so we'll check baby's weight we will measure baby's head circumference and the midwife will also carry out the initial baby check so the initial baby check is where the midwife will look from baby's head to toes um, to make sure they've got 10 fingers 10 toes um, and have a really good look um, at baby um, now obviously once we've done all of our checks we'll tell you if there's anything um, that we think needs to be um, seen further for by a doctor for example but if everything's all normal um, then that's the time when yourself or your birth partner can put on baby's first nappy and put on baby's first outfit so you can obviously we let you do that um because obviously it's really important that you um do the first nappy and um, clothes for your baby but we will be there as midwives to offer tips for you first time parents um if you need them such as what way the nappy goes on um and people often ask us as well about the umbilical cord so we'll be there offering lots of top tips um now another thing that's going to happen on baby's birthday um we may do it uh, around the same time we're weighing baby or maybe a little bit later on depending on your wishes of course is vitamin k um, and i'm going to talk about vitamin k um, after we've talked about this slide um, obviously on the birthday we're going to be offering continued feeding support throughout the day um, when babies are first born they don't necessarily need to be fed sort of every three or four hours as they do when they're getting a bit older so day one day two day three for breastfed babies we know that they may only feed three or four times in the first 24 hours um, but as midwives will be there on hand to give you lots of feeding support um, also on the birthday we may commence any observations which are clinically indicated for your baby. Um, now obviously not all babies need observations but there are some that we know um, who may be at higher risk of things such as infection um, or withdrawal. Now things that we um, link to sort of higher risk of infection is um, meconium in the waters. Um, if your membranes have been ruptured for a prolonged period of time, um, withdrawal observations for particular drugs that you may have been on in pregnancy. Now this list is sort of endless. It does, there is lots of reasons why your baby may be on observations and the midwives will talk you through quite um, in detail why we'd like to do them and what we're looking out for. Um, but observations of baby are just checking their um, general colour and well-being and handling um, and checking their temperature, heart rate and respiratory rate. And we'll sort of be doing that quite regularly um, throughout the first day of life. We may also commence the hypoglycemic protocol. Um, now this protocol, um, some of you ladies who may have diabetes or gestational diabetes may have already had this discussion with your doctor or midwife. Um, but there are other babies as well who may need to be on the protocol. And what this protocol is, is just monitoring for low sugar levels in babies. Um, and we know that babies born to mums with diabetes are at slightly increased risk of having trouble with regulating their own sugars in the first day of life. Um, and other reasons such as if your baby's been born and is over 4.5 kilos or under 2.5 kilos, or if you've been on any particular medication in pregnancy that we know can interfere with sugar control. Um, but as, as with the sort of observations, the midwife will make it very clear to you um, why we'd like to start this protocol and, and what it's going to look like and mean for you and your baby. Um, and if ever someone says, you know, they want to do observations or um, check baby's blood sugars and you're just not sure why, just make sure you ask. Um, and we'll always be um, happy to tell you why we'd like to do that for your baby. 
Now let's think a bit more about vitamin K because this is the first sort of decision you're going to be making for your baby earth side. Now vitamin K is, is a vitamin um, which naturally occurs in many foods and it's really, really important to help with um, a number of our body's normal functions. And one of those functions that um, we uh, look for in particularly is blood clotting. Um, and blood clotting obviously helps to prevent bleeding. Now we offer vitamin K for all newborn babies um, because we know that they're born with quite um, a small amount of vitamin K in their blood. And some babies can suffer from a, a disease called vitamin K deficiency bleeding, um, which is quite rare, um, but it does um, lead sometimes to bleeding from the nose, nose, mouth, umbilical cord, intestines and brain. Um, and it, as I said, it is quite rare. So normally about one in 10,000 may be at risk of bleeding. So we do re recommend that all babies have this. And at Princess Sam, we recommend that babies have this on their birthday um, and via injection. But there are two ways of giving vitamin K, and this is your choice to make. Um, so injection, as I said, it's the favoured and recommended way of giving the vitamin K at Princess Anne. We give it into baby's thigh muscle, um, and it's only a one-off. So once it's done, it's done, and we don't have to worry about doing it again. Whereas if we give it by mouth or orally, we have to um, give it via um, the mouth once at birth, once at one week, and then once at one month of life. So as parents, you guys will be giving the second and third dose at home. And the reason why we um, administer that three times is because we know that the oral dose, um, babies can spit it out. So we know that we're making sure that they're definitely getting it in um, if they're having it orally but as I said it's totally up to you um, what, what way you want to give it to your baby um, or if you don't want to give it at all but if you're or if you're just torn between giving it and not giving it just please make sure you uh, talk to your midwife um, about the vitamin K there is no risks associated with it um, there was some evidence many many years ago um, that linked it um, to some childhood illnesses but that research has all been sort of found to be unreliable so um, there is a fact sheet which we will um, we can put up for you for a link and you can have a little read through that. Um, so that's a bit about vitamin K. I'm going to hand over to Amy now, who's going to talk to you about everything that will be happening on day one. Hello, thank you, Laura. Um, okay, so on day one, um, hopefully you will have had some sleep over baby's birthday, but not too much, I wouldn't have thought, because baby will be feeding very regularly overnight. Um, usually in the first couple of days after your baby's been born, um, you will be offered a, a NIPE exam, which is a newborn initial physical examination. And it's a little bit like a, an MOT. It's, a, it's how I always describe it anyway, like an MOT. We're going to look at baby from top to toe. We're going to look in the baby's eyes and make sure they've got a red reflex. We're going to look in the mouth and in the ears. Um, we're going to check baby's tummy to make sure there's no lumps and bumps where there shouldn't be. Um, we're going to listen to their heart and make sure that their heart rate and their rhythm um, and all things with their heart is nice and normal. Sometimes we can pick up small heart murmurs um, and if we do then they're, they're checked by a, um, a neonatal doctor as well. Usually these are um, are quite benign and, and quite normal actually in the first couple of days of life when they're transitioning to life outside the womb. Um, but occasionally they can prolong, so we just keep a close eye on those if we do pick them up. Um, we also check the baby's hips, which can seem quite um, brutal at the time, but we're, we're not hurting the babies when they're checking their hips, it's just that they're in a position that they're not naturally in. And when we're checking the baby's hips, we're just checking for normal movement of the hips and the legs and to make sure that there is no dislocation of the, of the hip, um, hip joints. They will be looking at that. Um, then we turn the baby over and look at the baby's back and we're, we're, we're noticing any marks from birth or, or anything that might be not normal. And we would, it's just a, a, a big MOT of the baby just to make sure they're fine. So that's usually that if you if your baby was born at home, um, it might be that one of our community midwives who are specially trained in NIPE examinations will come to the house to do it. Um, 
or it will mean if you if you've had your baby in the hospital certainly at the moment with COVID-19 around um, I think what we're doing is making sure the nightly examination is done before you are discharged home so that you don't need to come back to the hospital to have that examination done. Um, if you've got any questions at all about the newborn examination um, or any queries, then please just ask the midwives on the ward or speak to your midwife. Um, and that's that. So I'll, I'll move on to poopy nappies. Um, we have a slide here uh, that I'll just go through with you. So nappies can be a bit odd in the first couple of days. I'm sure you've probably heard already that when your baby is born, this is the kind of thing you're going to be seeing. It's a little bit like a, a marmitey, tarry, black, gloopy stuff that's quite sticky um, and can take a little while to wipe off. If babies usually would have one or two of these nappies a day um, and one or two wees in the first day, first two, one or two days of life. Um, it's really important these nappies are changed pretty much as soon as they've done them, really, because once they dry on, um, it's quite difficult to get it off. Um, so just try and make sure that you, you change the nappies regularly and that this is um, cleaned as soon as possible. We do advise that baby wipes not be used in the first couple of days, um, or in the first couple of months actually, of, of baby's life, because um, water and cotton wool is much more gentle on their skin. So, um, so just make sure you've got some cotton wool and water, warm water to be able to do that with. So if I move on to day three and four for nappies, um, as you can see, the nappy is changing colour slightly. It's not so black and tarry now. It's, it's a little bit greeny. It's like a seedy, greeny, yellowy changing stool is what we say. Um, and that's what you're experiencing on day three and four. And then by the time baby is five or six days old, it looks a little bit more like chicken korma like a, a, a yellow colour. This is the normal kind of colour we'd like to see in your baby's nappies. And of course, the, the older they get, the more they will be peeing and pooing. Um, so that's just something to, a little visual aid there for you, if you're not eating anything at the moment. <laughs> okay, so going back to day one. So another thing that will happen in, um, hospital when you're in for the first day will be the hearing screening. So we, we routinely check baby's hearing during the first 24 hours usually um, and the hearing technicians will come around um, and, cons and gain consent from you to do this, this screening and it's, it's very simple, uh, very non-invasive. They, they pop a little um, probe into the baby's ear and then they bounce um, vibrations off of the eardrum just to make sure that the baby's ears are working as they should be. Now, sometimes in that first day of life, um, their ears can be clogged up with all kinds of, um, with all kinds of things from the birth, mucus or um, whatever, fluid. And so sometimes one ear will be completely 100% um, past the test and the other ear may need retesting. Now, this is nothing to worry about in itself. What will happen is that an extra appointment will be made for you and you will attend a couple of weeks later and they will redo the test. Um, and usually that will be fine. If you have your baby at home or if you um, come into the hospital, have your baby and you're discharged very quickly before you can see the hearing technicians, then you will receive a letter in the post and an invitation to go along to clinic to have that hearing screening done. Um, any questions about that at all, then you, you can just ask the midwives on the ward. And again, feeding support. We can't talk about feeding support enough. During this first day, you, if you're breastfeeding, you know, handling your baby and, and getting into those positions and making sure you have a good latch is so important. Um, and some people will pick that up really quickly and lots of people will need support with that and we're there to, to help you. We're on the end of a buzzer um, and we'll make sure that you're, that you're coping well with that. And similarly, if you're, if you're bottle feeding, um, obviously we advise that you bring the pre-made bottles of milk in if you're bottle feeding whilst you're in the hospital because we don't actually have the facilities 
or the milk kitchens to be able to sterilize equipment and make up feeds. So it's important you bring those in. But before you go home, we'll be having a conversation about how you're going to be sterilizing your equipment at home, how you do that with the various different types of sterilizing equipment and how to make up feeds. And you'll have all that support before you go home. So going on to day two and three. So this will probably be when you're, you're settling in at home or baby's just getting himself or herself into a good routine. Breastfed babies will be feeding on demand unless you have a special plan for one reason or another. Um, they often feed very much at night time and this is very normal. Um, you know, we speak to lots of women postnatally who say, oh, the baby just did not sleep overnight and wants to sleep all day. You know, babies should be feeding at regular points throughout the day and the night. It doesn't change at night time. They still need to be fed. Um, babies can feed anywhere between every hour or every two to three hours, maybe every four hours. If the baby is well and feeding on the barn, the baby will be leaving you. So there's lots of benefits to feeding at night time. Your prolactin levels are higher at night time. So when you feed, your milk supply is much better. Um, but you have to make sure that you're sleeping when baby sleeps, you know, during the daytime, uh, if you've had a restless night with feeding, you know, make sure that you're sleeping during the day, not getting on with your chores or having people around for a cup of tea, although that's difficult at the moment, I appreciate. Um, it can be a tricky time, this, 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 this day two to four time can be really tricky. Your milk is coming in, so the first couple of days you've had your colostrum, which is that rich, lovely, um, calorific milk, um, milk at the beginning. Around about day three, your milk is coming in, your, your fore milk and your hind milk. And um, your breasts may feel very full um, and it may feel very different. Um, and at this point also, your hormones are plummeting into their boots after you've had your baby. And you might be feeling just a little bit, a little bit spiky um, or a little bit sad. Sometimes people can get quite emotional around about day three or four. Um, and that is a mixture of the, the overwhelming experience of becoming a mother, um, the, sleep, the sleep deprivation and not getting enough sleep. Um, it's really important that you make sure you're eating and drinking properly as well, looking after yourself so that you can look after your baby. Um, and also the, the change in the hormone levels really, really make you feel quite tearful. It's not unusual for us to visit ladies on day three or four and, um, and be having a little hug because you're, you're feeling a bit emotional and a bit tearful. And that's very normal, very normal indeed. So bottle fed babies will be increasing the amount of milk that they have round about this time. Um, they usually feed, this is usually, babies aren't textbooks in the same way that mothers aren't textbooks, you know, every baby is different. But generally bottle fed babies will feed between three or four hourly. Um, they have lots more wet and dirty nappies at this point and I've showed you the poo chart so that you know what colour that, that should be. Um, and if you need any further support in the community, we don't routinely visit now on day three. We used to visit on day three to weigh the baby if they were, if they were breastfeeding. But in this current time um, during COVID-19, we're trying to reduce the amount of postnatal contacts that we're making. So you will get a phone call on day three. Um, and of course you are invited and more than welcome to phone the community coordinators if you need extra support with, with anything at all. Okay. Little picture of the nappies again. And then on to day five, I'll hand back to Laura. So day five, um, once you've been discharged from the hospital, this may well be the first time that you're going to see a midwife again um, since you've been home. Now, this day five um, contact with a midwife or a maternity support worker at present is um, happening within one of our five maternity hubs across Southampton. And you will either get this appointment prior to being discharged home or when you have that phone call on day three with the community coordinator, she will give you an appointment for day five at one of our five hubs. 
Now, when you come into one of the hubs, as I said, you may see a midwife or a maternity support worker. So I do quite a lot of the um, postnatal day five appointments at Botley Hub, because that's where I'm based. Um, and so I'm going to talk you through what sort of things we're going to be doing on day five. So we're going to do a head to toe check of the mother because obviously we want to make sure that you're recovering well. Um, so we're going to ask you all about your bleeding, um, how your breasts and your nipples are feeling. As Amy said, your breasts change quite a lot around day three to four. Um, so we're going to make sure that um, you're feeling well with that and checking for any signs of mastitis. Um, we're going to be asking questions um, about how your legs are feeling, making sure you're eating and drinking because we're trying to rule out any signs of infection, any signs of clot in your leg or lungs. Um, we're also going to ask about any history of high blood pressure and check your blood pressure um, to make sure that's nice and stable. Um, and we're gonna obviously ask how you're feeling emotionally. And a lot of the time women say that they're feeling very tearful, um, which Amy said is very normal. And it is very, very normal um, because of the hormones and the milk coming in and being a bit sleep deprived. Um, and obviously we can talk you through that um, and give you some um, good ways of um, coping with that with those feelings. What I normally tell women is to close the curtains, put on Netflix and eat some chocolate um, because you don't need to be doing any chores at this point, um, just relaxing um, and making the most of this time with your newborn baby. Um, now obviously if you've had a cesarean section we're going to be looking at your wound so we're going to um, encourage you or we can take off your wound dressing on day five um, and we're going to have a little look at the stitches underneath there by this point they've already started to heal so we're going to make sure that that healing process is happening normally we're also going to look out for any signs of infection in your wound now a wound infection um, on a cesarean uh, scar looks sort of it gets quite inflamed puffy angry looking so i do recommend women once the dressing is off to keep an eye on it um, and to make sure it's nice and clean and dry and um, we're also going to offer women who've had uh, sutures so stitches down below um, a check of those stitches now some of you may think actually i don't want you to have a look a look down there because i'm quite happy that it's all fine and dandy um they haven't been causing me any issues and that is absolutely fine um but other others of you may think actually yeah laura can you have a little check um so i'm not quite sure what i'm looking at and i'm not sure if it's okay or not and that's absolutely fine also um, and similarly with the caesarean wound, we're just looking out for signs of sort of inflammation, um, sort of a, lots of pain, pus um, that's offensive smelling. And if we were to think there's any signs of infection in a wound or in your sutures down below, we, we can always take a little swab to uh, rule out any infection. So we'll be doing that on day five. Um, and then we move on to baby. So when we are looking at babies on day five, um, we are checking out their behavior. We're gonna ask you lots of questions about what their feeding pattern has been like, what their color's been like. Um, we are going to ask you to strip them down to their nappy so we can have a good look at them top to toe again. And then we're gonna weigh them. Now, when we weigh babies on day five, it is very normal um, to expect weight loss. Um, now, weight loss is normal up to 10% of baby's birth weight. So anything 10% or below is normal. If your baby was to have lost over 10%, the midwife would then talk to you about what action needs to be taken. Now, that may be just a feeding plan between the midwife and yourself, or that may um, look like a midwife phoning the neonatal team to ask for further support if we were concerned about the weight loss. Now, we are obviously really um, keen to know about the feeding, particularly in breastfeeding babies on day five, um, because we want to make sure um, that from day five onwards, they're going to be gaining weight. Um, so we're going to be asking about the frequency of feeding, how long baby's feeding for, if you're happy with the latch. Um, we're going to be asking questions about their wet and dirty nappies, because their wet and dirty nappies are a really good indication that they're hydrated and, and getting enough milk. And obviously we can answer any questions that you have about breastfeeding and we can even help support you with a feed during that appointment and give you any top tips. Now, if your baby was to have lost over 10%, we would make an appointment with you um, a couple of days down the line to recheck baby's weight to make sure baby um, is gaining weight. Um, and obviously that will be arranged with the midwife or maternity support worker that you're seeing that day. Um, now, another thing that we're going to be offering you um, at day five 
um, is the newborn blood spot test. Now the newborn blood spot test is um, recommended screening um, by um, the government for all newborn babies and I'm going to go into much more detail about this on the next um, few slides. Uh, so newborn blood spot test. So you can see a little picture here on the left um, and this is what the newborn blood spot blood spot test looks like when we're actually doing it. So you can see the little card there and what the midwife is doing is actually we make a little tiny incision on the baby's heel and we like to make sure the heel is nice and warm before we do it because that helps with blood flow and makes it easier. Um, and then we're going to get four little uh, spots of blood in those four circles that you can see there. Now the reason that we do this blood test on day five is because we're looking um, to find out if your baby has one of the nine uh, serious health conditions. Um, now these conditions um, normally come from if yourself and your partner carry or are carriers of the, the same condition. So as I said, it is quite rare for babies to suffer with these, um, but we do know that there is um, good treatment for baby with any for babies with any of these nine conditions. They're not curable, but we know that we can treat them to help um, improve their quality of life. So you can see all these um, conditions here. So you might have heard of things like sickle cell, cystic fibrosis, um, congenital hyperthyroidism, which involves the thyroid gland. And then we've got um, a number of very long named metabolic diseases down the bottom there. Um, so those are all of the ones that we screen for uh, routinely on that blood spot test. Now, um, obviously it is up to you um, whether you consent to this, but we do highly recommend um, that we take this um, blood test because early treatment, as I said, can help improve their health and help um, prevent any severe disability. Um, so that will be done on day five. Now, what I also like to talk about is jaundice. So when I do the classes, um, I like to cover jaundice because jaundice is quite a common um, condition which newborn babies um, can get um, at around um, sort of three to five days of life. So people, a lot of people know what jaundice is. It's when the skin um, goes yellow. So I'm going to talk you through it in a bit more depth now. So jaundice is the yellowing of the sclera, so the whites of the eyes, um, mucous membranes such as the gums and skin due to a substance in the blood called bilirubin. Now bilirubin um, is produced when red blood cells break down and we know that babies have a lot of red blood cells. Um, so as they start to break down as they're um, on earth side, um, it produces this yellow substance which then gets trapped under their skin um, and can make them look a bit yellow. Now, some babies may also show other symptoms of jaundice, such as pale stools, so white poo, uh, dark urine, and just being quite tired and reluctant to feed. Now, if you notice that your baby is yellow and has any of these symptoms at the bottom, you must call either the community coordinator, Broadlands 111, uh, to make sure that your baby is seen, um, to make sure that we're checking, definitely checking um, over the baby and maybe even checking the baby's bilirubin level. Now, as I said at the start, jaundice is very common. So it is estimated that six out of every 10 babies develop jaundice um, and eight out of 10 babies who are born prematurely, so before 37 weeks of pregnancy um, can develop jaundice. So it is very, very common. Um, but only around one in 20 babies have a bilirubin level high enough to require treatment. Um, and jaundice often Often starts around 48 to 72 hours of life um, and when it does start around that time that is normally classed as a normal time or physiological jaundice. If you notice that your baby's become jaundiced before 48 hours of life or particularly in the first 24 hours of life you must 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 alert a healthcare professional to that um, so we can check baby over and make sure that there's uh, no underlying health conditions um, that are causing, uh, causing this. So if we go on to the next slide. So the way that we may check bilirubin levels. So sometimes a midwife may just look at the baby um, and think, actually, um, there's no need to do one of these more formal tests because the baby's feeding well, the weight loss has been within normal, or the baby may have even gained weight. Um, baby's nice and alert, um, doing lots of wet and dirty nappies. So the midwife might say to you, go home, keep an eye on the colour um, and obviously to call the community coordinator if um, you have any concerns that it's increasing or the baby's got any signs of deteriorating jaundice such as pale poo or dark urine. 
Um, or we may use a small device called a bilirubometer, uh, which um, shines a light on the baby's chest. Um, and we do, we, it's like a little, I don't know how to call it, but we touch the machine on the baby's chest three times, and then it gives us a reading, which we um, can then plot on our um, graph and see whether it is at a level that requires any treatment. Um, and then a more f even more formal test is uh, taking a blood test, so a sample of baby's blood um, to check the serum bilirubin levels. Now, if that bilirubin level on the first bilirubometer um, is looking like it's quite high, we would then recommend that you go into the hospital and have a serum bilirubin taken. Or if we think actually we just definitely need to get a blood test taken because baby is looking rather yellow, then we would ring the neonatal unit and send you up to them. Um, now, obviously, if this is happening to you, we're going to be explaining in depth what we're doing, why we're doing it, and make sure that you're fully informed. Um, but as I said, sometimes we're quite happy for you guys to go home and monitor it yourself. And what we would often do is make an appointment to see baby in a couple of days time for a midwife to review baby again and make sure that the jaundice is getting better. Now, more often than not, babies often recover from jaundice by 14 days of life. We do know that breastfed babies, it can take a little bit longer. Um, but what the way in which we uh, recommend you treating jaundice at home is to um, keep up regular feeding. So feeding baby at least every four hours um, more and even more often than that, um, if your baby wants it. Keeping an eye on baby's wet and dirty nappies, reporting any signs of deterioration to a midwife, 111 or your GP. Um, and as I said, some babies um, who require sort of a serum bilirubin test, if we think the level is high, um, they may then need uh, treatment in hospital. Um, and this will be discussed with you by the professional who's taken the test um, of the bilirubin level. Now, I, so I hope that's been informative with regards to jaundice, because as I said, um, jaundice is very, very common. Um, so it's important for you guys as parents to know sort of what's normal and what's not, so you can report um, to a midwife or GP or 111 if you have any concerns. Um, but I'll hand over to Amy to talk about day, what will be happening on day six to nine now. Thanks, Laura. So, so from day six to nine, we don't have any formal routine visits. Um, it's really individually based. You know, if you guys need support with feeding or if you need support with any other aspects of parenting, then you can phone us and make individual appointments for us to come and see you. Um, but routinely, if, if everything is fine and your feeding is progressing fine, then we would um, make a phone call just to make sure you were okay. Um, and give you the, the numbers of support. Your points of contact for support would be Broadlands Birth Centre, the New Forest Birth Centre, the community coordinators, breastfeeding babes, and of course, if you had concerns about your baby's house or your own house, then 111 or your GP. Um, one of the most important aspects that we haven't touched on yet is actually safe sleeping. Um, we would be talking to you about safe sleeping uh, during the end of your pregnancy and certainly within the first couple of days of your baby being born. Um, safe sleeping is really important um, and having the awareness of what to look out for um, is really important in reducing the risk of, of babies succumbing to, to cot death. Um, so the information that we give you around safe sleeping is that um, babies should be um, slept on their back with their feet at the end of their Moses basket or their crib, um, with a small blanket um, that they can't shuffle under. No quilts, no, no cot bumpers, no toys in the top of the, the Moses basket, that type of thing. Um, it's really important that babies don't get too hot. So we generally say, um, baby will have one, one more layer than you have. So if, if you've got a vest and a nighty on, the baby would have a vest and nighty, nighty a baby grow and a small blanket um, over them. They don't, they don't need to be snuggled up um, with quilt covers or, or anything like that. They, they don't want to get too hot. Um, the other thing that we suggest is that if there are any smokers in the house, that people do not smoke in the house. And if they do smoke, just to be aware that they are still breathing um, toxic um, fumes um, after 20 minutes of having a cigarette. So just to be aware that if a cigarette, if somebody has had a cigarette, 
to wash their hands and change their, their clothing and make sure it's been 20 minutes before they, they go near the baby breathing on the baby. Um, again, with regards to safe sleeping, it's advised that we don't co-sleep. So making sure that it's so difficult. It's so difficult at three o'clock in the morning when you're so tired and baby's been breastfeeding and it's very easy just to drop off to sleep and just have baby next to you. Um, but it's so, so important that we don't do that because we know that babies can shuffle down underneath the quilt. And if you're very tired, you might not notice that baby has shuffled down underneath the quilt. And obviously there is a risk of baby suffocating if that happens. So be advised, and it's strongly advised that once you've fed the baby, um, pop the baby back into the Moses basket next to your bed or, or wherever the Moses basket is. So we advise that babies are slept in, in a Moses basket in your room for the first six months of life. Um, obviously, as they get bigger and outgrow their Moses basket, then they can transfer to a cot. Um, but it really, it's for, for ease of feeding to, to be with you next to your bed um, is, is probably naturally where you want your baby to be anyway. Um, the other thing we talk about during this time is something called ICON. Um, and it's something that the midwives will speak to you about before you get discharged home or before they leave your house if you've had a home birth. Um, ICON is about coping with crying babies. Um, and we all know that when we are sleep deprived and we are um, stressed because we're, we're overwhelmed by parenting, sometimes the cry of a newborn baby um, is difficult to cope with. The, the ICON programme is to let you know that it is okay to put your baby in a safe place in the Moses basket or in the cot and leave the room. Um, you can put your baby down if your baby is crying and just leave the room for 10 minutes so that you can gather your thoughts and calm yourself and then go back to baby when you're feeling that, that you can cope with. Um, there is lots of support out there for parents um, these days, you know, your friends and family can be good sources of support, your health visitor, your midwife, your GP, um, you can cope. Um, it is, it's, it's about knowing where you can get that support from and knowing that you can put your baby down um, and, and have that time for yourself if you need it. Okay, so going on to day 10 to 14. This is generally when you'll be discharged from our care. Um, if all is progressing well and um, you don't have any concerns and we're happy that, that baby is progressing and feeding well, then we will generally give you a call between day 10 and 14. And this will generally be your um, named midwife, your lead midwife, so that she can offer you some continuity and say goodbye. Um, she'll definitely want to do that. Um, and then we hand over to the health visitor. So the health visitor will then contact you via telephone, usually, sometimes a letter, but usually by telephone. And they'll organise a face-to-face -face, um, appointment with you, either in your home or in um, a health visitor clinic type situation. And then you will meet them. And your health visitor then cares for you and your baby up until your baby is five years old. So um, they will be responsible for weighing the baby regularly, for immunisations. So when you um, get your red book, uh, your red child health book, inside the red book, there is a list of all the immunisations that will be offered to your baby from about eight weeks onwards. Um, and you can talk to your health visitor about those. Obviously, it's really important that baby is registered with the GP. So um, once baby is, is formally registered and has a birth certificate, go to the GP, register the baby, and um, then you'll be organising your six-week check. So I talked about the NIPE examination earlier that we do on day one. Um, the NIPE examination is then in week six. The, the GP will do that again with the baby and um, give you a postnatal check as well, just to make sure that everything is, is going back to normal. Um, we also then start thinking about contraception. Um, contraception is really important to think about at this point because you are never quite so fertile uh, as when you've just had a baby. And um, although we've really enjoyed looking after you, I'm sure you don't want us to see you again in nine months time. So um, contraception is really important. 
it doesn't matter what kind of contraception the pill some people after they've had a baby would rather have a coil so that they don't need to worry about it for a long time or an implant so they don't need to remember to take any pills or anything um, but you can either talk to the sexual health services about your contraception choices or you can talk to your GP um, and sort that out I'll just add a couple of things um, just that have changed obviously um, with um, the COVID-19 being about um, at the moment the registry office isn't doing any formal registrations of babies um, just because of obviously the amount of people that would be coming in and out of the registry office in Bugle Street. Um, so do, don't worry about registering your baby formally at the moment and getting a birth certificate because that isn't happening just yet. Um, you will receive correspondence about that, um, but please still go ahead and register your GP at the GP surgery. That's really important. And obviously, as Amy said about the contraception, um, we are actually offering some contraceptive service at the Princess Anne at the moment. So we um, can give out the progesterone only uh, pill if you would like it um, before you're discharged from Princess Anne. So if that's something that you think would be really helpful for you, because then you've got it ready and you can start at ASAP, um, then please make sure you ask the midwives on the ward about that one. Um, but obviously, if you think actually the pill's not for me, then it would be a case of speaking to your GP at six weeks um, about other methods of contraception. Um, or just making, you've got, making sure you've got condoms on hand, because sometimes women think, oh, you know, um, I don't want to have sex yet, or I can't imagine having sex ever again. Um, and that is fine. Um, that is very, very normal. And women often ask, when can I have sex again? And it's not a case of there's a set date when, um, it's whenever you feel ready, whenever you feel comfortable um, and ready to resume sexual intercourse, um, that is a conversation that you can have with your partner. And we often recommend, um, you know, having some lubrication for the first time you have sex um, and making sure obviously you've got contraception on hand as well. Um, so that's just a little bit about resuming sexual intercourse. And other women think, oh, you know, um, I'm ready to have sex straight away and that's also fine. Um, but as I said, just make sure um, it's, you know, under your lead and um, when when you're ready absolutely okay so some good resources um, for your for your postnatal recovery that are available obviously your friends and family um, and I know that that is particularly tricky at this particular time um, but make sure that you you know use technology to be in contact with your friends and family um, use video conferencing um, social media um that type of thing just keep in contact and make sure you're you're talking to your friends and family it's really really important um your midwife and maternity support worker your msw um obviously they are on hand for your your postnatal care and they're here to support you with whatever you need your health visitor your gp and the 111 service are all also available there's an amazing app called the mash app who that is um available to all new mums um, it's an incredible app, actually. Um, it was designed and set up by a couple of parents who met in a park, um, both of which uh, were feeling a bit low and unsupported and a bit isolated. And as they sat, sat on a bench and chatted to each other, they decided to set up this social network for and new mums to come together and talk about the issues that they were facing together. And um, I know a lot of women access this app and I know that it's been hugely beneficial. Um, so we talked a little bit about the, the baby blues and um, feeling a little bit emotional after you've had your baby. Uh, it's very normal, as we've said, from, from day three, four, to feel very tearful and feel a bit low. Um, it's normal to feel like that maybe for a couple of days. It's not normal to feel like that for weeks or possibly even months. And it's very important to be very aware and your, your birth partners um, and your friends and family will be um, the people who will recognize this sometimes before even we do um, or, or you do it as, as mum. Um, and it's important that we keep an eye on postnatal depression. It's something that we need to talk a lot more about. Um, and, you know, of course, usually it's the health visitor that, that picks up this aspect of your care. But iTalk is um, an online referral system um, that you can, you can self-refer. And they talk about CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. They, they have talking therapies and sometimes, um, 
sometimes that might be a good service for you to to access um, however if if you do feel that you are slipping into a postnatal depression or you're you're just feeling like you're not quite yourself it's so so important to speak to your health visitor and your gp um, about this so that they can they can make sure that you get the support that you need um, and get you back on track that's so so important um, there is a COVID-19 family wellbeing pack um, that you can ask your midwife for, um, which I'm assuming you will be given before you are discharged from hospital. All kinds of information in there for your support. The Healthier Together app is um, fantastic and comes in all different um, languages, uh, which is great for all kinds of things from um, care of yourself after pregnancy, um, care of the baby, weaning, um, toddlers, young children. So the Healthier Together app takes you through the whole continuum and um, there's some amazing, they have a traffic light system on there. So you, you would type in a certain concern and it will give you a green, this is okay to stay at home um, and keep an eye, a yellow, you should probably phone 111 and, and seek further advice or a red, which is you need to go to hospital, A&E or, or um, 999. And it will give you that information depending on what your concern is. So that's a really fabulous tool. Um, and if you just go to the app store and download load Healthier Together, uh, the Wessex Healthier Together app is what that's called. And of course, we've got the Southampton Maternity Services Facebook pages. Um, that's got lots of up-to-date information about the changing service over the, over the next few weeks and months as we, as we continue with, um, with the current situation. And things are changing day by day, so make sure you keep an eye on, on the changes that are occurring. And I think that was the last slide for this one. Okay, so... What i just like to add is that normally when I do um, the class um, with um women and their birth partners and um, there's often a lot of questions about postnatal care care of the newborn which is um, um very very normal because obviously some of you have never had a baby before never had friends with babies so everything's just totally new so if after this video you have a lot of questions about sleeping feeding um what to dress baby in obviously please just write in the comments below or write down your questions and um, keep them close by, ready for Amy's uh, live Q and A, because um, then she can hopefully bash through a lot of those questions that you guys um, have. Um, but yeah, there's so much to know about postnatal care. Um, that's sort of like the main bits and bobs. But when you're discharged from the hospital, or when the midwife's leaving you after a home birth, we're going to talk to you about a lot of different things. Um, and we're going to give you a lot of different resources to look at. Um, so hopefully you'll be well covered with information. Absolutely. Um, yep. Yeah, so as Laura said, um, we've got the Facebook Live um, questions and answers on Monday at midday. Um, just as a little bit of fun over the weekend, probably tomorrow or Saturday, I will be posting on the Broadlands um, Facebook page a quiz an antenatal um, birth quiz, um, which I will go through the answers for on Monday whilst answering and taking any questions from you guys. So if you're interested in, in doing the quiz, then have a little look, watch this space, um, and I'll be posting it over the next 24 hours or so. All right, so it's lovely to see you and we will catch up with you again on Monday. Take care. This is our last video. Oh, it is our last video. So it's, it's Facebook Live on Monday and then Labourland Live with Laura the following, uh, on the 21st. And then that's it. That's our series concluded. Thanks it's for watching. It's been lovely. Thanks for watching. <laughs>